the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. Hello and welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Rebecca Larson, and I am here today with probably one of my favorite guests, and no offense to anybody else, but Dr. Emma is here with me today. Welcome back, Dr. Emma. Hi, Rebecca. How are you? Oh, I'm good. You know, I feel like I just saw you recently. Your favorite, you're my favorite host, that's for sure. <laughs> Why, thank you. Are you. You had that lady this summer. I didn't like her very much. You know, the one that talked about quality in art, that host, she was kind of annoying. <laughs> she wasn't. Stop it. You, <laughs> I'm only kidding, guys. You, you did a great job. Well, today is like our Halloween episode, isn't it? Woo! Ooh, it's Spooky. like my favorite holiday. I, I love dressing okay, I up. I can't wait to show what I brought for oh, everyone show, to yeah. see. For those Ooh. of you who can't see it, I have a little Katrina... Because it's not just Halloween, it's the Dia de los Muertos, also, it's a few days of transition, really. Yeah. So we can definitely start to feel it here in Minnesota, right? We always like to do our intro about Minnesota, right? Well, we do, <laughs> you know, and speaking of that, I recently saw on social media that they were predicting snow this week, so I hope oh, that is Again, wrong. Halloween, <laughs> remember I told you about that? Yeah, yeah. Oh. They were saying It's possible. actually been warm. It's been warm. You're getting excited for Halloween, and then it's like, it's going to snow in Halloween. You're like, why? Can you not wait till the first? No. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But winter's coming. We know this. I feel like it's like... Winter is coming. <laughs> Game oh, of Thrones. People, Game of Thrones fans are just going to freak out right now. <laughs> I love that show so much. Winter is coming. I'm more obsessed with House of the Dragon than Game of Thrones. I think House why of the Dragon... It, I think it's superior. It is so well done. I have watched the series season one and season two probably eight times already okay do you think it's because game of thrones didn't have the best end and we can all agree that all the fans can agree on that come on guys let's not get offended i don't i don't know that i like the story uh, uh house of the dragon i like the acting i love the sets i love the way it, there's lots of dragons and i've become right, obsessed right, right, with right. dragons they got you with the flashy dragons right yeah they, i yeah. want to be a dragon rider Oh, well, me too, I guess. <laughs> that would be nice. Can you imagine that? Yeah. Yeah. When we went it would camping. It would be so much easier to go to Europe back home, you know? Yeah. I mean. Just buy my dragon over there. Exactly. Exactly. Right? I do think... you want to send a, 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 it's been awful the past two days in Spain. There's been some floodings. Oh. Uh, a lot of, um, a lot of people are displaced right now. So I do want to send all my love to Spain right now, to all that area. Murcia, where you know, where I work remotely, obviously, uh, Valencia and all that area, they've just had the worst. Um, they have a weather phenomenon called uh, the Gota Fria, and this year was just very, very bad. So there's been very bad flooding. So all my love to them. Um, so yes, that's that's also yeah. The weather's changing. We we're experiencing now the beginning of winter, right? And that's why we celebrate Halloween because really, well, you know a lot about the beginning and the origin of Halloween, right? You. You did some work on this, didn't you? I did, but it was a really long time ago. And I'll be honest, I did not brush up on it. <laughs> <gasps> what? what? I've, okay, let me just tell you, and everybody will be happy to hear this. My focus lately has been my Thomas Seymour book. That's very good to hear. So, yeah, finally, That's right? very good to hear. That's very good to hear because nobody knows more about him than you. So you need to be the one to write the book that you were, like you were saying to Sophie in the previous episode about, you know, how... How that's a very needed book too. So we we, we want to hear about, uh, especially to all these uh, figures that need a second uh, a review yeah. because they've been judged uh, too harshly or because you know um, just historians have have been. Um, each generation has you know uh, its own bias and its own things, and we just need to keep on going. And I'm sure in sixty years time, people will be writing other things about. Yeah. Um, Seymour or Catherine Aragon or all these people that we like to talk about. But uh, but we're going to talk and we're not going to talk about him today, right? We're going to talk about a, a much spookier Well, topic. you know, I always find a way to talk about him anyway. We can still bring him up if you want. Just, <laughs> no. just throw, throw in a fact. Did you know? Right. Yeah, exactly. Well, maybe do you want to start off by telling people what you know about the history of Halloween? And then we'll go into our fun topic for the day. Okay. Well, this is going to be a bit of a side story because really I didn't grow up with too much Halloween uh, spirit because I grew up in Spain and we don't used to celebrate Halloween as much as people, a bit, they do a bit more now. They did a bit, but we do celebrate the 1st of November. It's the All Saints Day. 
it's part of the celebration of Halloween. And that's kind of also our connection to El Dia de los Muertos in Mexico and all that. It's it's a really, this period is a period of three, four days where pagan cultures before the, the arrival of Christianity and all that celebrate kind of that transition. And they believe that the souls and of the dead people were around us for a couple of days. Now, I think probably because we start, the days are starting to get darker, the weather kind of is foul. And we have very comfortable, nice, warm houses now. But imagine living in a hut in the 15th century in Ireland. Oh, my goodness, where it was dark. That's where Halloween kind of started, uh, I think. Uh, the Celtics. As far as yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. I do feel connected to Halloween because, you know, as a kid, it was exciting. You would, you would in your, especially in your English books in, in schools in Spain, there were, you would learn about kids getting dressed up for this Halloween as witches. And that, that sounded cool, you know? So it always sounded like a fascinating thing. And then when I moved to America, I just love it so much. It's such a, uh, such a, people get into it. And I like anything that is into it, theatrical. And I think it's a very good way of um, just, just making normal some spooky things. So I think it does take away a lot of that thing. For example, in Spain, what was very typical was on the 1st of November to go to the cemetery and visit your, you know, deceased relatives. Mm -hmm. As a child, now I think back on it, it was kind of scary. I think it's a better approach to just put all the spookiness out and and just have a little fun with it. Maybe less scared about things like that, right? And about, it's really a reflection about death, I think. As yeah. the things around us in nature die, I, I suppose that was the origin because they were so connected to nature, right? Yeah. And, and we have to remind our listeners that you are also Irish. So it's like part of right, your right, right, being. Yeah. Actually, I do have a uh, proof <laughs> that I'm Irish. I took a DNA test. <laughs> but yes, yes, I do have that side. But I, I lived in Spain, so I never, I would always spend time in England, in Ireland, where Halloween is celebrated during the summertime. So I, it was never part of my uh, uh, growing up. It was part of my growing up uh, visiting the cemetery and reflecting on the lives of people that were before you that were part of your family that maybe you haven't even hadn't even met. Like, for example, I'm thinking of my Spanish grandfather, who I know just by stories. And that was a day to definitely go there and tell stories about him. And my grandmother would tell me stories about him. So, and then my grandmother died on Halloween. So <laughs> for me, it's like a, oh, but I think about it more as a, as a way to remind me that she she's, you know, she was such a big part of my life. And it's just these days I just, and there's a lot of people that have in my life birthdays around this time. So it's like death life. It's a bit of a, of everything. I like it. Yeah. I like dressing up as you can imagine. I do too. And now I work for myself. So I'm kind of bummed out this year. I feel like I don't have anybody to dress up for like I used to yourself maybe? i know that's what everybody keeps saying I'm like i don't really don't want to walk around my place dressed up and oh, you don't even want not your place you go to buy your coffee you're like oh i'm just you know it's halloween who cares you know yeah what would you dress up as if, if you if you were to i don't know this year? my classic costume like the last three years has been like a cat <laughs> Oh, a cat, like a spooky cat? cat ears and you have my cat paws and a cat tail just a cat <laughs> right um, I was like a pretend we, to be a cat, you know. Oh like. uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I I I have a cat, and I've always had uh, the, I've had this cat for seventeen years. My cat Mafala, she's a black cat, so we always say that we're always ready for Halloween. Yeah, yeah. She she does look spooky sometimes. I mean, she's I met, cats, I, but I love them. I love them. That's why I love them because they're they are like, the best. Because they've been, I mean, they're animals that have been judged and mistreated because of the 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 color of their fur, and and but I think they're so beautiful. Black animals are beautiful so yeah. we adopted a black cat 17 years ago something like that so yeah yeah and we, she's definitely i mean uh, she's worn little hats for halloween and things but she doesn't need much because she's already ready with her yeah. bright yellow green eyes and black blackness it's just um she's she's amazing um and we've been carving some pumpkins yesterday too oh. so that's always a ritual that i i, I knew happened but was never part of it and now you see them everywhere and it's just also a part of like that image that you have uh, of cultures like England, um, Ireland, but especially America with the pumpkin carving and all those sweet treats that you always get in America for every party, right? 
Oh, and I love some chocolate. I just buy myself chocolate for Halloween. I buy a big bag of like fun size Snickers or whatever, and I just eat it all by myself. Well, dress up, just say trick or treat and just throw it in your bucket and throw yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Do you watch any spooky movies? Because that's another thing that people <sighs> like to do. I used to until I started living alone. Now that I live alone, I do right, not right, like right, to watch right. scary movies because right, right. then I can't sleep at night. It's well, some of them are like, um, like Hocus Pocus. I, I, I oh, was yeah. watching Hocus Pocus the other day with with my kid, and I mean, that was that's funny, and like that is one I don't know anything favorites. witchy and like sort of fun, and it's just a bit ridiculous too. So I like that part of Halloween where you can just be a bit theatrical and ridiculous. Yeah. But today we're talking about something even spookier than Halloween. It's uh. Yes, because this is tell everyone? this is a topic that we have hinted at for like I feel for months, and I'm so excited for this year for the entire year. I feel yeah, like really, you should go back to see when it was the first time. But yeah, maybe on. that'll be the the quiz for everybody who's listening to figure out right. when we first mentioned the topic of poisoning. Oh, we're finally going to talk about it because what's spookier than being poisoned? Yeah, so Emma's been doing some research on this topic to give not us- like actual research where I was <laughs> drinking anything uh, to see how it would make me feel, but actually, <laughs> uh, that would be very silly. But actually, uh, yes, like yeah. you know, I, I knew a few cases, and that's why we started talking about them, or at least stories about possible cases. And that's something disclosure. I want to say that some of these haven't been proven, so we don't know if there were actual cases. But there were stories about it. So, I mean, it was always like a thing. And it makes sense because it's there's no quicker way than just being like, yeah, do you want to drink? Boom. And then bye-bye. So right. there's some very, very famous cases. Do you any come to mind when you think of poisoning? Well, yeah. The first one that comes to mind for me, and I don't know if this is one that you came across or not, is Edward the Sixth, whether or not he was poisoned. Well, no, but I love that because this is a podcast about the Tudors. Right. I mean, <laughs> honestly, he he was a young king. There were lots right. of men who wished to have the power <clears throat> of a king. And exactly. I just think it was um, it would have been convenient for John Dudley um, to uh-huh. have him poisoned so that his son and daughter in law could reign. I mean, would that? Yes, exactly. That, I, and that's that's another all of those cases that we're going to talk about are similar in that sense that that. You know, the the stakes are high when you're talking about royalty, about especially like someone who is not the strongest uh, sovereign like Edward. He's just a kid. Let's just face it. He was just a teenager. So and I mean, um, monarchs would try to be poisoned, killed all the time in this Mm -hmm. time. It's well, still now people, you know, so I mean, (laughs) But definitely, I I didn't I didn't come across this one. Do you want to? I'm not sure what that story is about. Can you can you elaborate a little bit? Well, I don't know that there is much of a story other than it. You know, there has been suspicion that maybe mm. that could. You know, maybe he wasn't as sick as he was made out to be at the time, and that poison could have been the slow right. death that he experienced at the end. Right. Um, right. It's all just speculation and rumor you know to as a, again to make john dudley look like the bad guy right right and that's that's how and then we have to think that a lot of these stories from from history have been retold by people like william shakespeare or you know you know they've been rewritten yeah. and, and sometimes you know something that seems like something that that could have been happening at the time is something that somebody wrote about a century later right yeah so we have to be careful because that's the way we construct these these um, really these characters where someone is really good and the other one is the one who is just poisoning any, everyone, right? Yeah. Uh, but I didn't know about that case, but I've always thought in the case of Edward, I just assumed um, there's a few princes at the time, like Arthur and John, Catherine of Aragon's brother, that die around the same age. And I just think uh, just adolescence was tough. Yeah. And for some reason, you know, um, that could be that that that's, you know, I, but I think that's very possible, too, because I think a lot of these people were were threatened all the time with with being poisoned. I, I would if you want, I'm going to talk maybe about some of the most famous cases of history, some of them. And then we could come back to the Tudor court because I want to leave the big the big ones for maybe. Yeah. I don't think people know 
about some of the names I'm going to bring up and some of the stories. No, I, I think that's perfect. Let's do that. Cause I do have another Tudor era one that I just came Whoa. to mind that I want to talk about, but yeah. What do you got for oh. us? Okay. So one of the most famous ones is Socrates. Socrates uh, from ancient Greece and he was in government and actually he was found guilty in trial and he chose to poison himself to, to die. So, uh, so just because, you know, in the time that we study in the, in the Renaissance, all these stories come back. Socrates has always been that kind of idea of the the, the guy who drank poison just because um, he found, he was found guilty. But um, was he guilty? Was he not? Um, and then also the 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 idea that that there's certain things like hemlock and things that that have been used uh, through time to 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 point this out. Another thing that I would like to say about poison. It's always been said, at least in the literature that I read in the 16th century, there was a woman's um, kind of way to kill people, right? It was womanly. But a lot of these stories are not women. Mm. So the second one uh, I think is really cool. Maybe people don't know a lot about it. But is you can be uh, poisoned with something that touches your skin, right? Yeah. Uh, for example, Juan Ponce de Leon. So now we're, we're, we're jumping into the uh, 16th century, 1521. So this is just after the feel of cloth of gold. But in America, the, the, the conquest of Mexico is just happening. And Cortes, this era of the conquistadores, all these guys going to, to over to the new continent and, and doing all these incursions. And when he, Juan Ponce de Leon was in Florida, when he was in Florida, he was shot. Uh, near what he thought had found the fountain of youth. So imagine how paradoxical this is. He had found the fountain of youth, but then he was shot by a poisoned arrow from one of the Calusa people. Mm. Um, so imagine how dangerous it was really to to be anyone involved in those kind of uh, trips um, to the new world. Because, I mean, imagine that, right? Um, ooh, yeah. Poor guy. So he died back. He had to go back and... He died from from that, so it's dangerous. It's da 16th century, anywhere is dangerous. Yeah, no <laughs> <Right>? doubt. <laughs> yeah, I was like, ugh, that that do. And then um, another one, very famous one, that I always like to bring up because he's very Halloweeny. Is Rasputin, right? Yes, ooh. that ooh. was creepy. Oh, it's so <laughs> creepy. Why do they? Every time I see those pictures, where they're all like. The, the the royal the the royal family Russian royal family is so they're all so cute and so gross and then Rasputin is there and you're like what you know with and his creepy guy. beard and and his creepy everything yeah <laughs> so that that's you know and like this guy was killed at least nine times or something like that I don't know crazy story too right I I, so. I don't know enough about him I guess I have to do more research on Rasputin I don't want to know any more about him to be honest with you yikes. <laughs> I mean, I think the first time I learned about Rasputin was that movie they did, the the Anastasia, back in oh. the day, the, the children's movie. Okay. It was like a like a cartoon movie. Disney. Um, that, yeah, no, not Disney. I think it was oh. uh, Universal Studios or some some rival company that came out with a couple of those movies. Okay. And he was, I mean, his face was green, so you got a hint of how bad he was, and he had a little like his little helper was evil was like, like bat it was just all very spooky and mm. i always thought rasputin was one of the spookiest people from ever from you know you think thomas woolsey's bad <laughs> <laughs> yeah imagine rasputin showing up in your dark room at night <laughs> yeah i just have a message for the queen oh my goodness yeah no i wouldn't like that um no so those were like the the, the some of the official. but i think in my opinion the most famous one is cleopatra Oh, yeah. Tell us about this. So Cleopatra, uh, for those of you who have lived in a cave have never heard of Cleopatra. <laughs> no, everybody knows about Cleopatra, <laughs> right? She was the last ruler of Egypt, of the Ptolemaic uh, kingdom of Egypt. So this is a big deal. Uh, she was the ruling queen um, of Egypt, of a nation that had been in antiquity, one of the uh, most iconic ones. We can all think about why, right? They, they yeah. build the, the pyramids. And um, so, and she lives at the time around, she lives in a very interesting time too, because she is, she lives around the same time as Christ, around the same time as Julius Caesar, as, you know, all these famous people from, you know, that era. 
And um, she just becomes an icon of sacrifice because in, uh, when, when she knows that Rome is going to take over Egypt and, and, and Egypt is going to become a province of Rome, how sad is that for her? Uh, she decides to commit suicide instead of giving up, right? And she has a snake, an aspid snake, and, and the snake bites her and is all very tragic, right? Uh, and this has been, and she became an icon for women's sacrifice, like other uh, female figures from antiquity. Uh, some of them mythical, but in the case of Cleopatra, she's a ruling queen and she's a real person. She was someone, right? Not mm -hmm. like other, other. I'm thinking of another famous person who committed suicide in antiquity, uh, a woman called Lucretia who was uh, raped by the king of Rome and, and she ultimately committed suicide because she, you know, because of what he had done to her. Um, and this triggered the end of the monarchy in Rome and the beginning of the Republic. This is more of a story to explain a change in, uh, from the, from, from two different types of government more than probably a real person, but she was still used like Cleopatra as a symbol of female resistance, really. So I, I think Cleopatra is just a fascinating figure and such a tragic end. It's just like we were saying, we like the cheers because we like the tea. So what's more tragic mm. than the queen dying just from a, 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 a snake biting her? It's just incredible. Yeah. 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 It's a great story. I, li I like it. And also this is important because these female figures from antiquity, we used by the women in the Renaissance to identify themselves to, and, and, and they were used in artworks related to these women and they would have painters paint them dressed as, as these women or because with those artworks, you transmitted a message, right? Yeah. For example, Catherine of Aragon often identified with Lucretia. Mm. But I think that was there was a hidden message. Well, not not so much hidden as to say, if you continue down this path, you're going to be doomed for Henry VIII, really, isn't it? Because that's really what she's telling him. Uh, when a woman from from that from the Renaissance is identifying with a tragic figure like that, um, it's it's because she's telling she's telling something to to someone like Henry VIII, and this is very important because um, Catherine of Aragon also identified with Cleopatra. Hmm. And a very important, at least very important, single work called uh, that was written by Erasmus of Rotterdam, and uh, the frontispiece was created by Hans Holbein the Younger. That book that we've talked about, written in 1526, and in that book, hmm. Erasmus of Rotterdam speaks about these women from antiquity and someone like Cleopatra. So. When Erasmus of Rotterdam is comparing Catherine of Aragon to Cleopatra, he's really saying she's the one in the right, really. And when Hans Holbein is using that image of Cleopatra in a book on matrimony in 1526 sent to England, what do you think they're saying? Yeah. Who's right? Who do you think Erasmus <laughs> of Rotterdam really thought was right? And Oh, he's totally on Henry's side, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, he, well, he, nobody dared to like say to Henry in his face, "I'm against you," other right. than you know the few that, which you know, were killed, like John Fisher, and and but those were more, those were more. Uh, you're wrong because of religion, because you're against you know like the true faith, the Catholic faith. Never, uh, you're wrong uh, because of your authority, because Henry was a king, so you couldn't really contradict the king, especially Erasmus of Rotterdam, who was someone. Who had, had been pensioned by Henry, who hadn't been invited to England to teach. And because you because they knew what he was doing to Catherine of Aragon, and really because they knew what was going to happen to her at the end. Yeah. And what happened to her at the end, what was it? Do you know, Rebecca? Mm, she died of heartache. <laughs> right. And that's why when her Spanish doctor opened her body, her heart was black, right? Right. That's, that's always that's, that's bit... typical. Of poison. Right. Of heartache, right? Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. I mean, everybody who dies of heartache, their heart turns black, right? Well, that's not, that's not the, 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 the thing is that the, the problem with this is that she was a prisoner. So all, every, all the documents that we have around her death are all biased documents to start with, right? Yeah. Uh, we also know that the people who were with her 
only spoke English, the, you know, the, the spies really and the people. Uh, and she had a Spanish doctor and they told Henry several times, we don't know what they talk about. And the Spanish doctor, after she died, told the, the imperial ambassador that he was quite sure that she had been poisoned. And the fact that she also had been preparing her own food in her own chamber for almost a year is because there was threats. Yeah, so it's, sad. Um, it's so sad to think that she had to be that paranoid about somebody trying to off her because she was in the way. Right. I think she viewed it in a different way. I thought she viewed it as a trial, as a trial that God had put in her way. And she was determined to show everyone that even if she died by poisoning, she told Mary when in one of her last letters, just take your fate with an open heart because she thought she was going to be a martyr. And that to her meant that sh she had, you know, her, she was going to heaven. Right. Yeah, yeah. She was she, for not for one second did she think she was in the wrong. So if people were as bad as to poison her, it was even a she was going to just have the gates open to heaven. You know what I mean? So I think that's the way she viewed it. I mean, that doesn't mean that she didn't suffer. She of course she suffered. That's why in the last years of her la of her life she lost her temper sometimes with Woolsey and other people and said because she they were like and she called them out for the what they were doing they said she said several times you're sending me to worse and worse places i know what you're doing mm. so it just you know uh, they it's always been said at least i get this a lot in spain oh he didn't dare to kill her right he was she was the one that the, the queen that he didn't dare to kill because he kills Anne Boleyn five months later right yeah uh, and i say did he not Maybe he used a more subtle way to kill her because he just couldn't, he couldn't really get peace with Anne Boleyn until Catherine was gone. Right, right. And then look, Catherine was and gone then and then he killed Cath Anne. Well, that's the thing. And then I think he was so superstitious that as soon as Catherine dies, poisoned, and most probably, let's just leave it there, um, and Anne Boleyn has a miscarriage, if Henry was involved in Catherine of Aragon's poison, imagine the kind of guilt. But that guilt in a narcissist doesn't just be like, oh, I'm going to take charge because responsibility for this is like, it's her fault, right? So she, he probably turned everything on Anne because of the guilt. I mean, you have to feel guilty when you probably have, to, or at least if he didn't poison her, he treated her so badly to see if she would die off somewhere yeah. that he would put her to die. So I think once she died, I think it's one of those things you you wait for something such a long time. You think it's going to be the best thing that ever happened to you. And then it's not. Right. And then, you know, if he was still Catholic in his heart, he may have seen it as God punishing him. Right. It, Anne Boleyn has this mis miscarriage. It could have been the son that he wanted. Is God punishing him for offing his first wife or wishing her out of the picture? There's so many thoughts that go into what was going on in Henry VIII's head at the at that you know, time. When, I, when people say that he didn't believe that his marriage is valid and this and that, I think he had lots of troubled thoughts about everything. And I think everybody did. And unless you had a very straight mind like Catherine Aragon did and was very disciplined in, in her beliefs, I think Henry fluctuated a lot. So maybe, yeah, of course. And But I don't think he ever thought it was his fault. I think he was just God's will changes or God's will, whatever, you know, he was just, but I think he he was truly one of those people who always thought the fault was in somebody else, not in him. So I wouldn't be surprised if he was the one to order Catherine Aragon's poisoning and then just the guilt and the miscarriage and then all that just drove him crazy, really, because that's when he starts losing it, I, you know? Yeah, he really does, doesn't he? Yeah, he really does. Not that he was like, you know, <laughs> the calmest person before but i mean after that he just goes yeah yeah it's it's bad it's bad another one of the of the other famous people i wanted to bring up that maybe people didn't know and this is a different totally different story his own fault that he got poisoned but catherine's father fernando of aragon died poisoned Oh, see, this is the surprise that i was bringing did, you today i was gonna say did, did we know this have we heard this before Yes. You haven't? <laughs> I 
I feel like I maybe guess you I, haven't been here in the rumors in Spain. I haven't. No, I don't mm. follow it closely enough, I guess. Or oh. I haven't been listening to you closely enough. <laughs> oh, well, I, well, I was I was keeping this for a special episode. No, I mean, yes, yes. So the two very famous ones during uh, this time that we talk about a lot. Um, and we'll talk about Fernando de Aragón, so, so Catherine of Aragón's father, and also um, Philip of Hasburg, Philip the Fair, Joanna's husband, who probably Fernando of Aragón poisoned in Burgos. We've talked about him before, right? So do you, which one do you want to go with first? Oh, let's go with Fernando. Fernando. So Fernando Pretty died. Mad. <laughs> Fernando. Fernando is such a, such a Spanish name, isn't it? It is. It is. Isabel and Fernando are like the two most Spanish names you'll ever hear. <laughs> uh, and they're beautiful. Um, so Fernando of Aragón, we're in 1516 when he dies, okay? Okay. So long after Isabella, has, Isabel has died, she died in 1504. So we have to think that we have the story of them together, but then he lives on quite a while on his own and, and marries again um, a woman called Germana de Foix, okay? And he is trying really hard to have a son. Really, really hard because he doesn't want to leave Aragon really to his grandson who has been raised by Margaret of Austria in uh, Michelin, Charles of Hasburg, right? He wants a son at Astama. He wants his own son because his son died, right? His son right. Isabella died, so he doesn't have a male heir. Aragon is different to Castile. Women can't rule in Aragon. So he can't leave it leave it to Joanna, who he is imprisoned, who he has imprisoned. And he's ruling Castile for her. So, I mean, he's in a bit of a pickle here, uh, Fernando. So he marries Germana de Foix and tries to have a, a boy. And basically is poisoned trying to drink things to 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 have the ability to, to make children better. <laughs> so he was, ta- well, but... he was taking potions to make it's himself love more potions. fertile. He was taking or... love potions. He has love potions. <laughs> and he was he taking got... love potions because he was an aging man who yeah. still thought he, you know, he could, he could, he needed. I mean, we have to understand these people in their time. Fernando is not the king of Castile. He's the king of Aragon. You can't be succeeded by a woman. And the woman who is going to succeed you, you have imprisoned. And your grandson is still a child. And he doesn't even speak Catalan. He doesn't even speak Spanish because he lives up north. And, you know, so yeah. he did have his other. So um, um, Joanna had six children with Philip of Hasburg. And his second grandson was uh, Fernando. He was called like him. And he was raised in Castile because he was left behind by Joanna uh, in 1503 when he was born um, and he raised him, but it's just, that's not the way legitimacy works, right? Um, so Fernando was trying to do this when um, he poisoned himself, basically. So how did this all, do you, we know how this played out? Like just one day he took this potion and he croaked? Well, uh, he's, he was trying for a while. He was trying for a while, and so there's rumors in the court. The king is 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 desperate for a son. He's taking this. He's taking. They just talk about the things they do, and they. I mean, people took things to drink and little potions for many things. We have to think that medicine was uh, something that was not as uh, well. And right now, we take things. I mean, you take a t- certain tea for this when you have a cold with honey, and so what's to say that you were all l- l- drinking little things? So he was, and it was a rumor in the court and everything. So that's the way we know. And then mm, there's been analysis uh, of his um, remains. Oh. Yeah. Because he's buried with Isabel. So we have their bodies. And that's important, you know, uh, in the Capilla Real in Granada. Granada. Yep, in Granada. Put that on the list. That's the most beautiful place. One of the most beautiful places on earth, basically. So, I can imagine. Yeah. So he yeah. died of poisoning. Was it a drawn out death or was it like an immediate? Like, was he sick for a long I mean, time? He was he was getting old. So also we have think about Henry the seventh comparatively. Right. He was sick for a whole year before he died. Just people got older too. Uh, Isabella was in her 50s when she died. Fernand was already, you know, um, yeah. you know, it's just also. Yeah, he was sick for some time, was aging. 
uh, we these people have very short uh, lifespans, so and they could die of a cold, really. And and then we don't know because there's no forensic science at the time. So even this is all rumors and things. Unless you have like hard evidence, um, it's very difficult because the death of a king is a big deal too. I mean, imagine how scary it is for everyone who has been born under this reign of this great king that had this great queen. But now he's aging and his only heir is in Flanders and he doesn't like, what? So they're all desperate for him to have a son. So I don't mm. think they were against him trying to do it, uh, but he just couldn't. So who poisoned so, him? Himself. He was taking stuff <laughs> to try to have um, better swimmers. Oh, okay. So it wasn't necessarily somebody who didn't want him to have an heir. It was just a bad potion. It was just a bad love potion. Love Maybe it was potions. his wife because, listen to this, okay. this is a big tea. His wife, Germana de Foix, he dies. Then Charles of Hasburg comes, uh, sorry, there's um, some work, construction work being done in my street. So if you hear, that's that's it. So Germana de Foix, um, she stays um, uh, at court. And then Charles of Hasburg comes to Spain. He's only a kid, basically, 16. He ends up hooking up with um, Germana de Foix. What? Yes. Don't you <laughs> like it? Phil, he's so creepy. I don't know what it is about Philip that creeps me out. No, it's Charles. Charles, oh, Charles the that's what I meant. I'm sorry, Charles. Charles the Fifth. Same Charles person. V. Same person. Well, Charles the Fifth <laughs> is creepy because he's the son of Philip of Hasburg, who's creepier. Yeah. And that's the other guy that was poisoned, probably poisoned by Fernando of Aragon. Um, so this this is a good story too. Um, so yeah, Philip before, before you tell that story. Yeah. About him. I always love when you tell the story about what a wuss he was. <laughs> oh, Charles? Um, no, about um, Philip. Philip the Fair. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's so many Philip. I'm going to confuse these names here about when him yeah. and Juana were going yeah. to England. And he oh. was like, oh, it's scary out there. And she's like, yeah. let's go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, this uh, this is also spooky and related to all of this. You could die every every second of every day in the Tudor world because this is intense, right? And these people, especially that, you know, if you marry someone who's a foreign consort, but they become very relevant, like Juana became because she became Isabel's heiress, you have to go back and forth from Flanders to Spain. And you end up, you know, in if you're traveling a lot uh, in the in the sea, you end up having some encounter with a with a storm, with a sea storm. Mm -hmm. And that's the story that you like. When um, Philip and, and Juana are trying to go back to Spain because they need to be, uh, basically, they are the heirs. So they need to be, you know, um, they need to appear in front of the corte so they can be recognized as the legitimate heirs. That's the way it works in, in Castile. Uh, they're traveling there and there's a big storm. Uh, such a big storm that one of the, a whole ship is gone. All those people are dead. And at the height of the storm, Philip starts crying and he starts, he goes on his knees. I mean, that, I would be just like that. He starts crying. And, and then Joanna, everybody's really, really surprised because Joanna is just like, cool. Yeah. And she says something along the lines of, I never, ever heard of a queen that drowned. So you can be calm. It's going to be fine. I love that story. Calm down, honey. It's you know, Calm down, fine. honey. You know, <laughs> be a bit more dignified, okay? You are the future king of Castile. Yeah, compose yourself. And I think Philip was just, um, I do think that the children of Isabel and Fernando had a different aura, had a different way of taking adversity. Because in the Spanish court, um, they had been told. Whereas uh, to, to think like that uh, with the way they were, had been brought up religiously. Um, in the case of Philip of Hasburg, he's very similar to Henry VIII. They've been, they've grown up in a religious court, but a bit more, a bit more with mundane things and a bit more with a little bit of a party, um, party attitudes. Because Philip was, you know, and he wasn't really known Philip the Fur because he was so handsome. He was known Philip the Fur because he was so educated, supposedly, and he behaved so well in front of the court. When he was back home, he was an abuser and he was a bad person. Um, but that's the way just 
most monarchs behaved at that time, especially with a woman that has more power than you, like right. Joanna ended up having over Philip, right? So they have a very unequal relationship in terms of their personal relationship, but she's the queen of Castile. Right. And he, it, by de facto, is king, right? Exactly. But not by right, by matrimony. Yes. Just like Philip, his grandson, Philip II of Spain, became king of England by matrimony to Mary Tudor. But then when she died, what happened to the king of England? He had to leave because he wasn't the king of England anymore. So right. yes, they were the king, but no, they weren't the king. Because a king is just one thing. It's a person who can transmit his um, his legitimacy to the next. So they weren't that. They were kings because they were married. Yeah. 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 So let's let's talk about the poisoning of... Philip. Let's talk a bit about that trip because it's very interesting, right? Yeah, yeah. Because I think a certain Catherine Rarigan was a bit involved, maybe not in the poisoning, but yes, in the Philip is not good, Daddy. Because um, <laughs> so let's 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 find out where we are. We are in 1506. So let's see. Uh, so Ferdinand is ruling. Um, just after Isabel, Isabel, Isabel the first of Castile dies at the end of 1504. So that means that Joanna becomes queen of Castile and Philip becomes the king, the, the king in mm -hmm. quotes. Uh, <laughs> so they decide, of course, that they're going to go to Spain to rule Castile together. Right. But Philip is like, well, I'm going to be, I'm, I'm going to rule and you're just going to be quiet. And she's like, well, that's not the way things go in Castile. I don't know if you realized or got the memo that my mom was the queen and she ruled and I intend to do the same thing. And let's just leave it at, just trigger a uh, warning here. Let's just leave it at, he doesn't treat her very well, okay? Fast forward to 1506, they're going to Spain and they have this horrible um, experience at sea and they end up in the court of Henry VII and they spend like a month there. Uh, Philip doesn't let Joanna see my, anyone. She sees her sister just for an afternoon, right? But Philip is, gets very, very friendly with Ferdinand the Se uh, with uh, Henry the Seventh, right? He shows him all the palaces he's building. He's like, "Oh, I'm going to build a palace like this in Brussels. I love it." He's buttering up Henry the Seventh because if he's the king of Castile, but he needs to go Ferdinand back to Flanders. He needs the king of England. To make that same the, the space safe, right? Yeah. Um, they spend a month there, and there's great parties. And at that moment, really, what is happening in the Spanish court in in the Tudor court, the court of Catherine of Aragon, is that she's uncovered a plot between amongst her servants that were serving Philip interests instead of Fernand's interests, mm. and she has called them out. One of them is fleet to Philip. The other one, um, she sent notices to her father. So she's involved in this. And when Philip is in the Tudor court, she asks him to dance with him. And he's like, no, thank you. I don't want to dance with you because I know what you're doing. So she gets involved in this and she sends letters to her father warning him about fi what Philip is trying to do and declaring her loyalty for her father to Henry VII. So she let, she basically gives she gives time for Fernando to buy the poison and get it ready. <laughs> <laughs> He's back there going, okay, I have time. Okay, Catherine, know <laughs> it. I need to call a guy or two now. <laughs> so Joanna and Philip arrive to the Iberian Peninsula through above Portugal to Galicia, that area in Spain that's above Portugal. They come in and they end up in Burgos where Fernando meets him. Oh, my kids, I love you so much. Because they called each other my children. And he would call Philip my son. Like Henry VIII would call Fernando my father. Sure. Okay, they called it with familiarity in that sense. Because for them, marriage bonds were like you became family and like blood-related family in that sense, right? Oh, my son, my daughter, I love you so much. John is heavily pregnant. Supposed to be, you know, a happy meeting or whatever. And he's like, now you're going to rule Castile together. So I'm just going to go off to Aragon where I, you know, where my court is and you guys are fine. So have a great, great time. <laughs> and two days later, Philip is dead. Only two days. 
about three days. Still. <laughs> Enough time for the poison to take effect. Wow. So it was, it was, that was the, the, it was basically what it was said. Imagine for a heavily pregnant woman like Joanna, who has not been treated very well for a long time and has had six pregnancies all the, and then to just find a situation and your husband is dead and your father is like, um, Tulu, Tulu. And what, so then she, that's when really very sadly, Joanna just spirals down. And the whole burying of Philip of Hasburg becomes the spookiest story in in Renaissance history in Spain, really, because it they only travel at night. She doesn't let anyone come near it. And it's just people are scared in Castile when they see them because it's this figure, these figures in the night. Um, and she takes them down to Granada, where they are finally buried with Isabel and Fernando. Wow. Yeah. Well, why do you think it was that so she... the guys listen to this the guy that okay. poisoned the other guy are buried together <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's in that's so interesting like i all the poisoning you know people killing people and they end up but together see, in the end like they say oh women use poison yeah fernando also probably used poison uh to kill philip or was it fernando was it someone in a circle or who was it something happened but it was quite fine before arriving to Burgos and he hadn't had any problems. He was very happy to rule Castile on his own without Juana. And then after that, I don't know if Juana's imprisonment comes from her realizing what's happened and probably she tries to rule on her own and her father finally decides to imprison her. Refresh my memory it. here because yeah. she's heavily pregnant mm -hmm. when they get back. Mm -hmm. Her husband dies. Mm -hmm. Um, at what point does she go into labor? Like how long after? Do you know? Not very long after. And the baby's named Catherine <laughs> after Catherine of Aragon. Yeah. And she is basically imprisoned with her mother. She right. eventually becomes the queen of Portugal, Catherine of Austria. She's painted by Antonis Moore. There's a very famous portrait of her in the Prado Museum. She, um, Charles V, when he goes and visits his mother and his little sister, and where they are imprisoned, he's he's appalled by what he sees. He's appalled, but he doesn't do much other than <laughs> trying to take Catherine away So from Joanna, and Joanna loses it. And Charles is like, just give her back. Just, <laughs> it seems to me like Joanna would not take, would just be like, if she believed something, she was going to do it. And you just would not, she was very stubborn, very determined, the things that she wanted and the things that were, you know, her. And I think it's part of like, if, if she would have been a man, she would maybe probably been a good ruler because it, it's just something that was not for women to do. If women had wanted to be good rulers, they had to be like Isabella of Castile and Catherine Aragon. They had to be very calm right. and be able to to just take control in very very stressful situations. I think Joanna just lost, like Henry VIII. Joanna was a bit yeah. like Henry VIII in a way, um, and and. It, Fernando was just like, no, 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 no. You're just going to be, I'm going to have a boy. And how did that turn out for him? So he poisons Philip so he can rule Castile still. And he tries to have a boy, but he poisons himself. Like, Fernando wasn't very good with poison, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't his strength, was it? <laughs> no, it wasn't his strength. But uh, at this time, poison was was something that people used to have because another famous person of this time that was supposed to be using poison life, uh, left and right in Italy was Pope Alexander VI, the Borgia, the Borgias, the famous mm. Borgias. And they used uh, um, cantarella, so a type of, they were, they even have the specific venom that they would like to use. So like a little like, like uh, you know, like um, you leave a little trace of of you're the assassin because you've used that poison, right? So everybody, yeah. goes, oh, another one, another one that Borges killed because <laughs> they use the same pot. It's just scary to think, right? No wonder people had um, monarchs had people to try their food. Like it happened, and I don't know if you know about this with Elizabeth the first. Oh, I don't think I do. So Elizabeth the first, somebody tried to poison her. When was you this? Know? In the 1570s, I think. I need mm -hmm. to look up the the date. You got me the date there. Okay. Uh, but yes, she was trying. She was there was a 
sorry, a Spanish guy that tried to, to poison uh, Elizabeth I. And they, and they found out. They found out. And that's when she started having someone try all her food. I didn't know that. I guess I'm not very much into the Elizabethan period. I kind of stop in the. Well, what I'm saying is like the attempts against the life of the monarch were frequent. Fernando of Aragon was stabbed once. Oh, I didn't know so, that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, there there was frequent. It was frequent. Yeah. It's just I, brutal time, really. If you think about, it. we like it so much, but if you think about it, it's like, why do we like so much this such a brutal time? I know. I think about that frequently when we are posed with the question, if you could go back in time and experience a day or whatever. And and my curiosity, of course, is like, well, I would love to see this or see that. But I think I would end up dead because I'd open my mouth and say something treasonous. Witch! She's a witch! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Get burned at the stake. And I'd be like, well, this wasn't worth it. <laughs> well, that was a bad day. I should have stayed in 2024. I, was, I thought it was bad in 2024. Yeah. Yeah. Little yeah, no, I no, I would definitely find. So, do you go back as yourself or do you go back as a famous character? Oh, see, I always just imagine I would go back as myself. Okay. You don't want to choose Philip of Hasbert in 1506 <laughs> in Burgos, please, guys. Or unless you <laughs> unless you want to just go to a Halloween party, you could recreate uh, the poisoning of uh, Philip uh, the Fair. Yeah. Or, I think, of, uh, yeah. I think it might be more interesting just to go back and be a servant. And then you can kind of just be a fly on the wall and see what's happening. I'd be like a spy. Yeah. I'd be like hiding around corners, listening and see. What you happens. haven't you haven't seen many of these uh, <laughs> biopics because all the servants get all the blame for everything. This is true. This is why I would end up dead. <laughs> yeah, this is like I mean, especially in the House of Dragon. You say you keep watching House of Dragon, and everybody who's a servant there is a sense of dead. So no, um, if I had to go back. Uh, I definitely, I don't know. I would choose probably to be an enclosed nun if I had to go back to the 16th century. I think it's the safest place. Yeah, but then what's the point of going back? Maybe in a what cool are you place learn? with fulfilled of illuminated manuscripts and being the oh, okay. abbess. All right, all right. That's, I guess, for an art historian, that makes sense. <laughs> Oh, I'm like, why would I'm you want to so go? Lame. I'm so lame. <laughs> I'm like, why would you want to go back and be a nun for a just day? Just do the same as I do in 2024, but <laughs> like with the original documents. <laughs> yeah, I would oh like. I wouldn't want to go back and be like Anne Boleyn or anything like that. I'd want to be more of especially a... not Anne Boleyn because oof, the stress of being Anne Boleyn from 1526 to 1536 must have been amazing i mean i think she must have had periods of a tremendous adrenaline imagine imagine her all you know but at the same time that the the stress oof especially any woman that was trying to give an heir to any king imagine the day you had to tell him that you had a miscarriage or that yeah. something had happened the the idea yeah. that oof. i think it might be interesting to go back and be jane seymour right at the end of anne boleyn's time to see what really happened like what was going on in jane seymour's head in her household well when you were saying you wanted to be a servant think about the things the servants had to see and endure i'm thinking about the first time that catherine Aragon had a baby and that servant that was with her she almost died and when yeah. she was close to death, she she gave her the, to her servant this headdress and said, "If I make it through, the servant was like, I'll become a nun." Um, but I think that was more of a who would want to go through this? You know, labor was the scariest thing uh, for these women, and not only that is you you just had to do it because you had to perpetuate the the. And then for the women, it's curious how someone like Joanna, who has somewhat of uh, she's okay having kids then she's blamed for being crazy or for some other reason too yeah. outspoken to this it's just they, we always get the shirt and not the stick the women well we didn't have as much There's value. not enough poison if you ask me oh, no, I'm not kidding. <laughs> so are there any other poison stories i just like for example, I was when I was doing a little bit of research for this. I just like the way sometimes um, there's some um, the way that art portrays these things, right? Like, for example, I was thinking of a very beautiful painting 
by Guido Reni that's in the Prado of Cleopatra. And you can see the, so the, this is the power of also the visuals, right? Because, you know, Cleopatra was bitten by a snake and you, when you walk into a, into a museum and you see a painting of a woman and she's, you know, usually, oh, Cleopatra, right? Um, so that, that's also, and, and in this book by, by Erasmus of Rotterdam that we were talking about before, with uh, the frontispiece by Holbein, there is a depiction of a nude Cleopatra. For all the people say that Catherine Aragon was a prude, she had people put nude nudity in her artworks, uh, being bitten by by a snake. And I think because I studied the Catherine Aragon identified with Lucretia, I didn't understand very well why it was Cleopatra in this case. But Cle Lucretia and Cleopatra appear together often. And basically, this is just transmitting a message of you are wrong and she is right. That's why Cleopatra is in that frontispiece by Hobart. That had been used before for other books, but why did they choose that one? Right? Yeah. Because on that same frontispiece, there's a there's a there's a king that is corrupted. I mean, it couldn't be clearer, right? Yeah. The MNL College in Cambridge has the presentation copy that was just in the Six Lives uh, exhibition in the National Portrait Gallery. And that presentation copy has a handwritten note by Erasmus of Rotterdam over that frontispiece. So for Catherine, so basically they are declaring, he's declaring her, his support for her. He's sending Holbein to her and he's just hoping for the best, but he, he knows what's going to happen because Cleopatra finally dies. Poisoned. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> so that was my final thought wow wow well when yeah. we started we were talking about the Tudor era and i said oh. there was one incident that came to mind with poisoning and that's that's the thomas more attempt right where the, oh. the soup was poisoned at the meal and a bunch of the people who were there ate it and either died or got really sick and thomas more did not eat it and so he was spared i would have been the first one to die because whenever <laughs> food is on the table <laughs> you're like <laughs> no everybody's not has, hasn't started i'm already dead <laughs> yeah so then you know and and i don't think we ever know for sure who it was who ordered the poisoning it's always suspected that it was the Boleyns, right oh. because thomas moore was against Anne being with henry but in the end that was the cook who took the rap and right, right. and mr roos i think it was richard roos was his name and he ended up being boiled alive for his crime oh nice yeah. nice yeah and that was the first time that being boiled alive was punishment for poisoning mm -hmm. that was created just uh, for this I, incident i can't think why it was not used before because it's such a nice way to go isn't it <laughs> i just can't even imagine there's so many of those ways that people died or were executed back then where I go, what a terrible way to go. I can't fathom. Again, but when we see we love the Tudor era and then we think of the heads, the heads on spikes on the Tower of London and things like that, you're like, not that part of the Tudor era anyway. Yeah. But yeah, I'm, I think the, fifth, the the end of the 1520s, and, the, and this is what happens when a king becomes a tyrant. Mm. These executions that are gruesome in the I don't know why Henry's not known as Henry the killer. Well, the tool. We know him as Henry the tool, <laughs> but we about, you know, he was so vicious with some of the people who had been the closest to him. Um, and then I think a lot of the reasons why the Boleyns get a lot of um of of these uh, accused, because I mean, one of the people who was accused of poisoning uh, Catherine Aragon was Anne Boleyn. And then trying to poison Princess Mary too by the imperial yeah. ambassador uh, is th the reason why is because she was threatening people. Well, to be honest, <laughs> I've never heard I've never heard of a story of Catherine of Aragon threatening threatening someone to be killed. Right, you know, and she had a lot more power than than Anne Boleyn ever did, really, outside of the Tudor court, obviously. Um, so I think it was just probably out of fear, but making these accusations to people, people started to talk. Yeah. Huh, you know, be careful with this one. Look what she said the other day to the fun guy. He's not fun anymore. He's actually pretty depressed. He's gone. He's gone to Leeds Castle because that's where he has his unicorn tapestries and he's going to end up, you know. But that's the thing, you know. Yeah. That's why you end up being in the in the center of, of people's attention is because you're making these uh, uh, 
threats, really. So were they yeah. were they just out of fear, probably? But yeah, most definitely out of fear. I mean, Anne Boleyn and Catherine of Aragon were raised so differently, right? Catherine obviously was of a royal family. Anne Boleyn was not. So from the get-go, Anne Boleyn was already in a vulnerable position. Mm -hmm. And then when she's feeling threatened by somebody, the fear kicks in. And then, of course, when you're afraid, you say things that you shouldn't say or you do things that you shouldn't do. And that's what I think leads to these things. And I think it's not just the different upbringing, it's the different in character. Because Mary Tudor uh, is very different to her mother. She's more like a father in many ways and respects. And she has, so for example, I'm thinking of all the instances where Mary is just beaten, beaten because she doesn't want to go somewhere. She was also outspoken and things like that. It's just Catherine had a different character. She was just contained. And I think people are sometimes, you know, respect those kind of people who just stay silent, stay regal. And you're like, what is she thinking? What is she going to do? Does she have special powers or something? It's just a matter of having that uh, capacity to just maintain, uh, under pressure, maintain that kind of like, nothing's really happening, you know, when everything's just inside. So still, still, if we go to the sources, we do find instances where she is telling the ambassador herself, they're going to finish with me. And she tells her daughter. And I think when I say that she told her daughter, take this with uh, an open heart, I think, what else can she tell her? She can't do anything. Yeah. What was she going to do about it? People say, oh, she should have retired to a convent. Why? That to damn her soul for eternity? No, I don't think she would have done that, right? She wouldn't want that for her daughter either. The last thing she says to Henry VIII is, is make sure you save your soul. I love her. I love that every episode we end up talking about Catherine of Aragon because she's amazing. She well, really you know, she is amazing. And um, I'm sure that uh, she would have celebrated the All Saints Day. This was a, a in the Catholic uh, world. It was a, it was an important feast. Not so much Halloween. I think she would have been a bit scared of Halloween, probably. Mm-hmm. Um, but definitely for her and for anyone Catholic at the time, it was a time to remember the people that were before us. I don't think that's a bad thing necessarily. I think that's a good thing, right? So yeah, yeah. But I like Halloween better. I love Halloween. I do. I'm, love- I, what am I going to dress up as? I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to. I'm, I'm thinking either Frankenwoman Ooh. or a witch. Wait, I thought the classic costume for you was tired mom. <laughs> tired mom has been retired for a few years. Okay, tired okay. mom is just an attitude that I don't want to have anymore. <laughs> Good. It's just, I'm just going to ignore it from now on. Good. I'm tired, but I don't think about it. Good. <laughs> I, you know what? And I definitely could see you dressing up as a classic witch. Yes, yes. I've, 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 I mean, Mondays, I usually always dress as a witch. Uh, but I'll do it for Halloween this year, too. <laughs> yes. And, and if you do dress up, which I'm sure you will, because you'll take your daughter out, I want mm-hmm. you to take a picture so that we can share it with everybody what you look I like. I definitely know that my daughter wants to be the big bad wolf. That's Ooh. what she's going mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Oh, she's so cute. I can't wait she to see is. her costume. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll be fun. It'll be fun. It seems like it's going to rain and it's going to be very cold after uh, like a very warm spell here in Minnesota. But yeah. that's the magic of Halloween. It is. So do you take her <laughs> out in the neighborhood or? Yeah. You... The, okay. So for anyone that doesn't live in America, they, you should come for Halloween. Because people prepare the lawns, the front lawns, the decorated, and then in near my street, there's a whole alley where they do like a party and it's just people take it very seriously. The children have so much fun. The the costumes are so cute. And then, you know, the parents get to go with the kids and maybe they take a little, you know, cocktail with them to have a little fun, you know? And their parents are a lot of fun. Yeah, 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 exactly. Or a little soda, depends on the parents. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh, Emma, I love it when you come on the show. I'm so glad that you came on today for our Halloween episode. And we finally got to talk about poisoning, which I've been wanting to do for so long. I know. We talked about many of the things too, didn't we? We always do. There's never, yeah, it's, that's right. this is why it's always impossible to name these episodes because how do you title an episode where we talk about so many different things? Well, this one is, is poison. This poison. For sure. I'm just going to call this one straight poison. Poison. (laughs) You know, our last episode was just plain weird. 
Next one is straight poison. <laughs> we we you know we're 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 not lying to you. We're we're telling you what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Well, well thanks for having me, Rebecca. Thank so it's you. great. And and I think this is a very good idea to talk about these little topics because you know, doing the research for this episode, I had quite a lot of fun. Oh, good. I love to hear that. And hopefully our listeners also are, you know, intrigued. Maybe they're their interest has been piqued on this subject as well, and they'll dig a little bit deeper and let us know what kind of fun stories they've come up with. Poison about. stories, let's mm. a thread, people, I will please, for Halloween. Yes. Yes, please. Emma, thank you so much. Until, until you're back again. I hope so. <laughs> Bye, guys. <laughs> and that concludes another episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. Thank you so much for listening. If you love the show and would like to show your support, consider becoming a patron over on Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Tudor's Dynasty. Over there, you'll get commercial-free episodes, early access, and some patron-exclusive content as well. If you would prefer to show your support in another way, head on over to my website, TudorsDynasty.com, and click on the shop to see some of the new merchandise that I have available. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time. The Tudor's Dynasty Podcast.